Thank you, Ellen, and thank you all for sticking around. I, um, I feel like I'm either a stand-up trying to perform uh, dinner theater comedy uh, in the Poconos or uh, maybe Miles Davis performing jazz over the, the din of, uh, of clinking glasses at the plug nickel. And I'm going to try and keep the latter image in my head, at, at least, for this. So in my brief remarks, um, I'm going to provide a few examples of how California's water system and other wa water allocation processes coped with severe and widespread drought. In 2014, state and federal water managers and regulators uh, took a variety of significant actions to allocate scarce supplies and to protect environmental uses. So for example, uh, early in the water year, the State Water Board, Department of Water Resources, Bureau of Reclamation, state and federal fish and wildlife agencies uh, met in a series of meetings and agreed to allocate stored water uh, in Central Valley Project and State Water Project reservoirs for essential in-stream flow uh, and wetlands requirements. And this water would be released later in the water year as various demands uh, for it arose. Uh, in January of 2014, the board approved temporary urgency changes to CVP and state water uh, project permits that relax delta outflow and salinity standards for the two projects. And this allowed the projects to conserve upstream storage uh, for release again later in the year to meet consumptive demands and to pump water under conditions uh, when exports normally would not be authorized from the delta. And then for the first time since the 1976 and 1977 drought, the board also issued uh, curtailment orders for the Sacramento, San Joaquin, and Delta River uh, systems for the Scott, Russian, and Eel watersheds and for several other river systems as well. And these orders directed junior appropriators, uh, in most cases, permittees and licensees, so post-1914 appropriators, immediately to cease diverting water. The board also notified more senior appropriators and riparians that their diversions might be curtailed as well if severe drought uh, conditions persisted. And the board is in the process and has lifted almost all of those orders at this point. Although the water allocation and curtailment uh, procedures uh, were controversial, I think both generally worked well, especially given the hydrologic uncertainty, the limited time that the agencies and affected water users had to prepare and the significant economic and environmental interests uh, that were at stake. And I also agree with what Jeff Mount said earlier that really a lot of people in this room deserve a tremendous amount of credit for taking really heroic efforts under, under extremely uh, difficult circumstances. Also, as Jeff said, yet, uh, despite these uh, salutary efforts, uh, several important policy questions uh, emerged. So many affected appropriators question the fairness of the board's uh, decision completely to curtail their diversions of water in favor of those with higher seniority on the system without considering differences in type of use, efficiency of use, return flow, and other relevant factors. Critics, including some members of Congress, argued that the CVP and state water project overallocated water to the environment and therefore unnecessarily shorted some contractors. And conversely, environmental interests questioned the science and risk assessments that the interagency allocation group uh, used to balance environmental needs against urban and agricultural water demands. Project operators, fisheries agencies, and the board struggled to manage acute and sometimes conflicting demands for releases of stored water previously allocated for environmental uses, as well as water needed for uh, public health and safety. And Chuck Bonham earlier, I think, spoke very poignantly about some of the difficult decisions that he and his staff and others had to make in this context. And finally, many observers noted that the board's curtailment process was hampered by limited or out-of-date information on water rights, water use, return flows, and also lacked uh, proper scientific backing. Now, these programmatic issues and criticisms are not surprising. Regulators had to move quickly to accommodate and protect a multiplicity of interests under unprecedented hydrologic conditions. But we can nonetheless learn from this experience in planning for the next drought. And that next drought, of course, may still be taking place. So I'd like to offer uh, a few suggestions drawing in part on recommendations that Ellen and several of our co other colleagues uh, uh, made uh, to the board last October. Um, the first is that the board and its agency partners uh, should modernize the data and information systems used for the curtailment and allocation decisions. And this entails more than simply improving the technology used to measure uh, and, and uh, excuse me, to measure and predict flows. It also requires annual water diversion and use reporting from all water right holders, especially the largest water users. Moreover, it requires reporting on discharges, which comprise a major portion of the flow of some rivers in California. 
Second, the board should revise its curtailment procedures to define urgent public health and safety needs, especially for those users who cannot reasonably find or have alternative sources of supply, rather than waiting for those users to self-identify as occurred this year. And the board and the interagency allocation group also should adopt policies that identify priority environmental uses, including flows to ensure protection of vulnerable fish and water for state and federal wildlife refuges. And I agree with Jeff, Chuck, and others on this point. Third, the board should revise its curtailment procedures to allow it to consider factors other than strict priority uh, of right when deciding how to, how to allocate avail available water during times of shortage. And these factors should include each diverter's type of use, actual use of water in the three to five years preceding curtailment, net depletion of water from the river, therefore taking into account discharges and return flow, uh, as well as access to other sources of supply. And this change, I think, would enable the board to take into account a broader array of considerations in addition to priority that are relevant to the question of fair and efficacious allocation of water in times of severe shortage and gain a more realistic assessment of the effects of each diversion on the actual flow of water in the rivers. Now, all three of those are changes that can be made ahead of time uh, and really must be put into place ahead of time. So they involve the type of planning that the earlier uh, panel talked about. This final recommendation is one that we'll have to apply really more situationally uh, and, and really on the fly, I think, as the drought proceeds or as we go through our next drought. And so this last suggestion is the board should exercise its statutory and constitutional authority to prevent waste and to promote the reasonable use of water. And these actions should include stricter supervision of urban uh, and suburban water agencies' demand reduction and efficient use programs, including pricing, uh, as well as greater scrutiny of water districts and individual users whose methods of diversion or use of water are either wasteful or impose inordinate burdens or harm on other users in the system or on the environment. Uh, these are the types of things that Susan Mulligan mentioned uh, could use a little nudge from the state in her comments earlier, and I certainly agree with, uh, with her recommendations. And the board also might consider whether local restrictions on the transfer of water in times of drought constitute an unreasonable use under those circumstances. So with that, I, I hope that I've given the panel a few uh, things to mull over and contradict uh, or, uh, or refine, uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, for your time during lunch. Thank you, Brian. Okay, let me introduce this great panel. So we have Felicia Marcus, who is the chair, just reappointed chair of the State Water Resources Control Board, who's been dealing with this pretty much nonstop since about a year ago, you know, before that probably. We have David Guy, who is the head of the Northern California Water Association. And David knows a lot about water, um, in, in this particular case, I especially wanted him to be here because he knows a lot about water held by folks with senior water rights. And so the, his agency is a sort of an association for a lot of the, the senior water rights in the Sacramento Valley. So I know he has some strong thoughts on, on a lot of these issues that, that Brian just raised. Then we have kind of at the other end of the spectrum in terms of seniority of water rights. Um, we have Jill Dwerig, who is, heads the Alameda County Zone 7 Water Agency, which is an urban agency which relies very heavily on state water project water, which is kind of at the, I'm not gonna say it's the most junior, because they're probably something more junior, but it's definitely on the junior end of the scale, um, and has been very affected by the allocation process also that Brian mentioned. And then we've got Bill Croyle, who's kindly stepped in at the last minute for Mark Cowan, who, who couldn't be here, but I was really glad to he, when, I, when I heard who was subbing for Mark, because I think that you're in a really good position, as well as, as, well as Mark, to <coughs> talk about these issues. Bill has been, before, the, before this latest drought, he was, a, he was one of the key flood guys. And just to show that you know, management of extremes is, is kind of, you know, when we're not having a flood, um, you can step in as, as a drought emergency manager. So he's been, he's been playing a key role in the state's emergency management on the drought and has been involved in all kinds of things in relation to that. So we've got a, a, a great team here. And I think, um, you know, kind of following what we've been doing with the other panels, ask you all first to kind of 
you know, dig in your thoughts on Brian's proposals and, you know, how would you, what would, what would be your kind of priority for, for this coming year in terms of, in, in terms of making some changes down the way? And, and I'll start with Felicia. Oh, I don't get to go last. You're changing it up. Um, uh, happy to react, and I'll react quickly, and I know we'll have a conversation to get into more detail because there are a lot of proposals. Um, the first one on modernizing information, my notes to myself were, heck yeah. Um, I, I do think the information issue is a really big one. It's a, it's a large issue in terms of all the information that you might ask for. We'd love to have massive amounts of information, but I think thinking about how to actually have real information on which not just we can make decisions, but everybody can see the nature of the decision to be made uh, is really important. Uh, as to which parameters, you know, what reporting is worth the effort, uh, et cetera, the cost benefit of it, I think it's important. But I really think at a gross scale, we had enough information to do our job this year. Had we had more precise information, it not only would have made it easier uh, to do the job more quickly and transparently, but it also would avoid, have avoided um, where I see a tremendous and it's a shame, a tremendous waste of human energy going into talking past each other because reality can be in the eyes of the beholder in a very faith-based way. When you don't have data you can agree on, even on basic flow numbers, not, not the river flow numbers, but in the water rights context, people can in some cases say it is whatever they say it is and it there's nothing to you know, we've only had since 09 two tranches of the every three year data. So it's enough in terms of self-reported data to make these gross calls, but it's actually not enough for us to be able to have the kinds of conversations in a transparent way that uh, some of your previous speakers were fabulous talking about the kinds of conversations we need to have. I think we did remarkably well despite that, but uh, modernizing the information, just as Australia took a decade to do, um, would be helpful. So any, any little bit I think would help. Um, on considering public health more explicitly, you know, we were poised to do that. Um, we ended up not needing to do it. It was an interesting conversation where I think we have the legal ability to do it and we could have, we would have had to litigate that out just as everything in water rights um, is litigated, but there were two aspects of public health um, and safety that I think we could do a better job on this year a little more clearly. We, we didn't have to decide on it. We did in the Mildir Antelope, but that it's, it's a, it was smaller in the Mildir Antelope um, situation. We didn't need to because we actually ended up coming up with a more innovative way to deal with it because with the drinking water program moving over in July, we realized that they actually have a mandate to issue serve water notices. So we would have had this conflict between the two agencies and so they came up with a way to go to those communities and put very tight conservation rules on them, tight restrictions or tight directives to go find alternative sources of water, meaning by a lot of the things that we were asking for in the health and safety um, arena. And so we went with that this year as the senior water rights holders in particular, whose water rights we would be protecting, really didn't want us to do it. And they volunteered to help communities. So it was a very interesting choice. But again, being more explicit and thinking about how we as a society and when in the context of the water rights law think about that is important. The second place where I think we, we all know we need to do a better job is in the early days in, in uh, at the end of January, the first temporary urgency change order that uh, our executive director, Tom Howard, who's amazing, um, uh, did, we, you know, there was a sort of, we were all so afraid, he was afraid and everyone was afraid that we were going to lose salinity control in the Delta, which hasn't been talked about as much today, which was really the g huge 800 pound gorilla we were all worried about, because if we lost salinity control in the Delta, it would have been useless for human or agricultural consumption in the Delta or for export, which somehow some of the combatants seemed to forget that that was a big deal. And so there was a put the pause button on to try and conserve everything we had in storage, Shasta just being one of them. Um, and with so we cut off exports with a public health and safety exception not defined because we were leaving it to the projects or he was leaving it to the project come back. And that ended up being some viral sense that all of a sudden that meant 
that every municipality in Silicon Valley, everybody would get all the water they wanted, which was not at all what was intended. And so, you know, words um, mean a lot. So thinking about that more, I agree. Um, doing fish flows, yeah, I think we need to think about it. I mean, we do have, you know, as Bruce pointed out, we do have our flow objectives uh, in a number of places. We don't have them everywhere. And I think what we did in Mill Deer and Antelope to set the most minimal flows, those belly bumping, get over the riffle flows in conjunction with Chuck uh, and, the, and Nymphs, as Chuck described far more eloquently than I can, um, was a really smart thing to do. And we did it and took that priority because that was where the fish agency said the most threatened native fish were. And so I thought it was a very um, minimal, mar you know, intelligent thing to do. And we need to think about that more uh, ahead of the curve. And I, I do think uh, it becomes important as we start talking about what we're doing in this. It's, it's not, there is an argument to be made that we shouldn't be balancing fish flows because they're already so low compared to what the fish needs in the public trust context, in any other context. So um, we did the balancing. I mean, Tom did, the fish agencies did. We affirmed uh, later in the year what he had done, so I'm allowed to talk about it now. And there's a certain point I'll go back behind the curtain where I can't talk to anybody inevitably in this water year. Um, and I think people made some hard choices that were very thoughtful. And I think we just need to be as thoughtful as we can dealing with the reality um, looking beyond priority, I, 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 I'm taking the fifth on that one, uh, in a way because I think, A, we have the system we have, which is a priority system. I, I would settle for implementing it better, uh, true to the spirit of the existing system, and I would leave it to the legislature and others to um, decide if they want to come up with a different scheme. I would settle for implementing this system in a more transparent and more uh, reality-based way, which is um, uh, consistent with how I started earlier. And on reasonable use, I do think we need to focus on it more. It's interesting, in past droughts, we've used our reasonable use powers, and we've used it in a lot of other um, circumstances, whether through emergency regs and, uh, for the frost regulations or other things. I think it's a completely, uh, and we've used it in the, we've used it and we used it in the mill deer antelope um, decision. I think that's a powerful tool that we need to use thoughtfully, um, really thoughtfully. And in past uh, droughts, we have in the urban context too. And uh, this year, we haven't spent as much time on it because we did have the power to do the emergency conservation regs, and that has been a full-on um, pedal to the metal effort ever since we uh, implemented them, and we are in the process of considering what to do next, either to change those regs, people have asked us to tune them up a little bit, should we do different kinds of regs, should we amp them up, or should we use our waste and unreasonable use authority either about specific uses or specific geographies uh, as opposed to painting everyone with the same brush. And so it's going to be a year of being uh, very thoughtful of using all the tools we have. And fortunately, those tools have been augmented significantly by the bond. So we also have uh, dollars to help people do the things they need to do to make the whole system more efficient, whether it's conservation or recycling or stormwater capture or desal in appropriate uh, circumstances. I think um, we have a whole bucket of tools that we have to look at to try and figure out how to make the system uh, work more smoothly. So um, a lot of good suggestions there. Thank you. Okay. David, thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Let me uh, provide a couple of reactions uh, to Professor Gray's uh, comments, which I thought framed uh, the issues quite well. Um, I would agree um, in general with the uh, thought that, you know, we ended up in a pretty good place. And I give uh, uh, Chairman uh, Marcus and uh, the Department and Bureau and Department of Fish and Game, others, a lot of credit for that. Uh, it didn't start very well, uh, as Felicia, I think, was alluding to, but I think it did get to a, a better place. And I have a couple observations that I think are important for that. Um, the first was that I think uh, at first, to me, it felt like the agencies were kind of stepping on each other's roles. And I think once the agencies kind of got in their lanes on the freeway, so to speak, and all started driving in the same direction, you have operators, you have regulatory agencies, and I think when they respected each other's um, role in the process, to me that's when things started to actually gel. 
um, I think as, as Felicia was suggesting. And I do think that the uh, process ended up in a pretty good place. Um, I think um, give a lot of credit. Again, it was a little bit slow, but the department and the bureau's operations plan um, ended up pretty spot on. I'm actually kind of amazed that a lot of what they talked about early in the year, when you went back and looked at kind of what they had projected, what they had said, yeah, I mean, there were little places here and there that you could say, oh, it didn't quite, but overall, it ended up to be a really good uh, operations plan and a good projection, and obviously, it got us through the, through the year, and so I think a lot of uh, credit goes uh, to that. With respect to the water board and the curtailment process, Professor Gray suggested, yes, there was a lot of uh, pain, a lot of folks who didn't like the idea of curtailments. We were in a position where we were actually asking the water board to curtail water rights sooner than they did. It took about a month for them to, to do it when we thought they had an ability to, and it was understandable. Everybody was trying to get caught up with the hydrology, with the data that uh, Felicia was talking about. But um, again, I think the junior water right holders that we work with knew that this was coming. They were ready for it. In fact, they had you know, lots of decisions to make from a business perspective, and so they were pushing for that to happen sooner rather than later if, in fact, it was going to happen. And so uh, you know, I think the curtailment process actually turned out, I think, uh, pretty, pretty sound, and I think we all learned a lot from that that we can improve on. Yes, we can improve on the data. One of the things we're recommending to our folks is that they do submit annual data and try to get as much real time as we can. The three-year reporting cycle doesn't make a lot of sense. So you know, whether folks will do that we'll see but at least we're recommending to the folks in the Sacramento Valley that they get into that and to get that uh, and we're working very closely with I saw Barbara Evoy here earlier uh, her staff over at the water board working very well on trying to get that common set of data to support the uh, the curtailment uh, process and I think we're we're making progress it was it was not pretty this year but I I do think it overall uh, worked uh, pretty well the one area that I don't think the water board did enough on was protecting uh, storage releases, um, and that's obviously a big uh, football that is now in front of uh, the Delta Water Master and uh, some others that are going to be tackling that, but I don't think the Water Board uh, took the right action with respect to that this year, and I think a lot more could have been done. Obviously that storage water, as I'm going to talk about probably later, is so vital to so many beneficial purposes, and I think that we have to protect that water um, uh, through the whole system, and uh, there needs to be more uh, there. I can obviously expand on that if folks are, are interested. Um, last reaction, uh, uh, Professor Gray is talking about uh, waste and unreasonable use. Um, he wrote an article uh, that I still love the title of back in the 80s, uh, In Search of Bigfoot, wasn't it? I think you were, uh, I, I assume uh, not many people have written uh, water articles related to Sasquatch. And I have always thought that was such a cool title. I've always uh, thought that was cool. But anyway, a lot of good thinking that went into that question of uh, what is uh, Article 10, Section 2. I guess I have a little different thought that I think as we go forward, I think we have to start thinking about Article 10, Section 2 in a little different manner as we go forward. I think the first thing is that there's the provision in the uh, uh, Constitution that talks about that we have to use the water to the fullest extent possible. That's the first clause in Article 10, Section 2. And that's to me what we have to do in a drought. We have to figure out how do we use that water. And Director Bonham talked about the way the water was managed so that the cold water could be used for salmon and then could be used for refuges, could then be used for farms. That's the kind of creativity that I think got us through this year uh, that several people have alluded to. And to me, that's what the Constitution calls for. Let's use every drop of water as well as we can, maximum through the system. Yes, if there's people out there that are using water unreasonably, duh, yes, they should. Uh, uh, that you should be utilized, but I don't think that's the first uh, course of business because the reality is I think most people are using water for beneficial purposes. We just want to encourage some of these creative uh, uh, solutions that we've been uh, talking about. So I'm going to stop there and uh, looking forward to the, the rest of the conversation. Thank you. So Jill, how about your take on this? Well, as you said, we're in a little bit different place in the spectrum than most people uh, when it came to a 5% allocation that wouldn't be available to us until after September 1st, we get over 80% of our water from the state project. And we were coming off um, two previous years of drought and some major construction along the aqueduct that delivers the water to us. So we'd been relying on our groundwater basin much more than we would have in the past. So we started into this and said, we have a certain amount of groundwater we like to pump every year to manage our basin. And uh, that's not going to get us to the point where we 
can survive with a full use. So we declared back in January a 20% cutback and had to bump that up to 25% by April when the rains weren't as great as we'd hoped. Um, it put us in a very interesting position, especially when we started talking, and, and this gets to Brian Gray's proposals, um, about urgent po public health and safety. As we looked at our system, it wasn't just about urgent public health and safety. There were other factors keeping the businesses in business. Um, distribution limitations, where some parts of the system we couldn't get water to from our groundwater wells because we're used to having um, a state project importation. So we had um, some concerns about the original approach to that and wanted to make sure that if we ever got to a point where water utilities or others were being asked to look at urgent public health and safety needs, that it would be taken within the constraints of the local agencies and that um, there might be opportunities to make a um, proposal for other factors, whether it's a power generation facility or a um, something else in this area that has a need for water and would have otherwise been completely down to zero and having to shut down businesses. Um, reasonable use is another one that we really look at. While we have been improving our use of recycled water enormously in the um, what we call the Tri-Valley, which is the Livermore, Dublin, Pleasanton area, it also means that every time we increase recycled water, we decrease the ability to respond to an emergency drought. So we have several retailers, and they had a range of response. We averaged across our system 29% savings this year because of our early imposition of mandatory cutbacks. But our area where there was the highest use of recycled water just barely cleared 23, 24%. Whereas those that had a history of not using as much recycled water were well over 30%. So we could average across the whole area 29%. And I think that that has to be something else that the community is aware of, that as you increase that reuse, as you're using every single drop to the maximum possible, you have less leeway in what you can do. You've already cut, you know, pulled in the belt buckles and you may not be able to diet that extra five pounds away. Um, another piece is integrated uses. We have a lot of facilities because we manage a groundwater basin too where we normally bring in, um, we have flood control channels. When they're not being used during the summer for flooding, we use them for groundwater recharge. And the groundwater recharge allows for habitat enhancements and restoration. It also allows for recreational opportunities. So as we had less water to recharge this year and we cut off recharging, we had several local parks that had to shut down because they just didn't have enough water. We had to um, basically let a lot of our new plantings in a major restoration project uh, dry up and we'll have to replant. So that habitat has now been delayed four or five years. It was in um, baby oaks, and as you know, if you let them die, you're several years behind. Um, so there were other beneficial uses that suffer when there's not water available, and I just wanted to bring that up too. So it's when you talk about reasonable use, you have to look at all the benefits that are coming from that water. Thank you, Jill. Bill. So I'm going to wear my, as usual, put on my emergency management hat. Um, this was an extreme drought. It was an emergency. It was declared as an emergency. Um, and I think because of that, it, we actually set up an environment to break down some barriers that we would typically see. Um, and I think as we look at the kind of the scenarios or the proposals being made, um, as a emergency manager, whether I'm working flood, which was in December, um, then also um, throughout this drought, we need data, we need information, we need situational awareness, we need to measure how good or poor we're doing in responding to uh, the current situation. And so I think uh, listening carefully to the uh, number of the Australian delegate that's been coming to town and Jane, as we l talk at the local level, how, how we get to measure conservation at the house level or the community level, I think 
um, really grounding ourselves and looking at, we're trying to make decisions um, based on data collection systems that are either outdated, have been reduced over time, and so that affects our decision support system. It makes the risk higher, um, the error bar is a little bit bigger, and I think so being able to kind of push um, this disaster and never let a good disaster go <laughs> unused um, is to really look at how we're um, collecting and process processing information, especially across boundaries, across uses. Um, I've, I've heard a couple times today remote sensing. So one of the things as we got into this, with the limited staff that we have across our state departments, and realizing we need to answer some questions at the local level, we don't have enough staff, and so going through things like remote sensing and sharing that information, whether it's with Food and Agriculture, the State Water Board, and, and for a wide variety of issue or um, concerns, then being able to process that and make that available. I think part of the challenge too is with data uh, comes, you need to the extent possible make that transparent so that not only the state agencies or the regional agencies can use that information, but make that information available to the local agencies. Um, I would say that kind of information, we can save a phone call, we can all, all uh, move a little bit quicker to respond to a particular issue um, or a threat. I think this, this um, environment is set up a communication between the state and the White House that would provide some opportunities with regard to how we run the state and federal projects. Um, it's certainly with the governor's office and a number of the state agencies on a weekly basis, sometimes more. Um, that's added a lot of value on how we kind of get at what we're doing with our issues, um, where the comfort level is with the administration, how we take advantage of things like California Water Action Plan, Prop 1, and especially as we move into um, this next um, year, hopefully not dry, but it's looking dry. One thing I think um, some of the, as we kind of deal with some of the concerns and threats, um, uses, reasonable use, the real-time water operations group that was formed um, in early January at the highest level to bring those key agencies together, uh, both on the environmental side, the, um, both state and federal resources, the state water board and the two projects. They were meeting a minimum twice a week, if not more, weekends, nights, to come up with the plans, procedures, um, assess the risk, uh, forecast forward, and really kind of be able to, as a group, uh, make decisions, present credible information to the board that we can get comfortable, the board can take action, and we can get back to monitoring and managing those dials on the system. Um, in my view, that process allowed us to transfer uh, 350,000 acres feet of water in a very difficult time with very little water to San Luis Reservoir to assist at least on the health and safety issues south of Delta. We still had um, west of Delta and north of Delta concerns to work with, but that kind of dialogue, that kind of commitment on an hourly basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, and for the last year plus, now has allowed us to really kind of, again, push through some of those envelopes so we can talk about reasonable use, conservation, data management, data collection, transparency, and things like that. Thank you. So on the data question, um, just so everybody knows, when Felicia was mentioning about the every three year reporting, um, there are some serious props that go to the legislature and the uh, Schwarzenegger administration for one piece of the 2009 package that was that was enacted that that included surface water reporting requirements for folks that have pre 1914 rights and riparian rights. So for the first time, they really had to be reporting. So the the requirement is every three years. It turned out to be, I think, my sense is hugely valuable in this drought. It was really lucky that we had that. It was something. Yeah, right. You know, so at, at the time when that was, I remember when that, what, that was enacted, a lot of folks were saying, oh, this is too weak and everything, so. But some people thought it was horrible. Right, right. But it's, it's so it's, it, was a, it was a useful building block, I just want to say, for, for, for thinking about this information um, systems. You know, there's been discussion of how can we, you know, can we make it, and we're suggesting maybe annual for at least for large, large diverters um, would, be, would be good. We're also suggesting something, um, kind of the other piece of that, nobody flinched at it, so I just wanted to push back and, and sort of see um, your, your thoughts on it specifically. The idea of reporting on discharges too, which now, so uh, this is sort of basically once you apply the water and use it, 
it's what, what comes out of the system at the end. And so cities actually do report this. It's usually a different agency. It's your wastewater agency that, that has to um, re report what they're, what they're discharging back into streams. On the ag side, definitely the, the laws have changed in, in such a, and the regulations have changed in such a way that, that the ag folks are having to really monitor what they're doing on the discharge side much more than they used to have to be. But it, it's my sense that in most places that's, that's not yet a, a requirement and, and we're, we're suggesting maybe that should be also. And, and our reasoning for this is that in a lot of situations, uh, the return flow, what comes back in through discharges is an important part of what's actually available in the, in the stream. So we'd love to just get quick reactions on, on that thought um, in particular. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. David especially. Yeah, well, uh, just a couple thoughts. I mean, I think obviously you know, data is, is obviously everybody's friend. Um, I think though the old adage, you know, that it isn't enough to have the data. You actually have to have people that understand it. And that's the challenge. And that's again the relationship that I know we are trying to establish with the water board staff is to have the folks that, you know, sit at the water board, work with the folks who represent folks out on the ground and to have that communication because they each understand the data and have a little different context to bring that. And I think that's the formula that we hope will will help the water board understand the data and be able to make more meaningful decisions. And then the folks on the ground can obviously understand that process better as well. So I think that's, you know, it's really understanding the data. It's not that there's plenty of data. We're all living in a world where we have probably more data than any of us can process, quite honestly. Um, so I think that's the first piece. With respect to the discharge uh, dynamic, um, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that uh, in dry years, uh, there are not a lot of return flows. Um, uh, so I think it's a little overstated that that's an issue um, because the reality is when you have a 0% supply, what's the return flow, right? Um, when you have a 50% supply, I guarantee you, you are tightening up the system so much that there is not going to be a return flow. So I think it's, uh, I don't know that that's a big solution to be honest. With that said, it's an important issue and I think is what you're seeing is that water districts, at least in the world that I'm working on, are obviously all tackling water balances in a little way, which is really what you're talking about. And doing that at a district level, doing it at a sub-regional level, and then DWR, I think, through some of the Bulletin 160 process and does it on a kind of a pure regional scale. And so I think it's understanding those water balances, Alan, that I think is really the important thing. And yes, if there's a discharge that is significant that can be looked at, then I would welcome that. But again, I think during a dry year, let's be real practical here. There are not a lot of folks that are discharging water. Right. And I guess, you know, I mean, I'll hasten to say that it matters which system you're on. And, you know, mm -hmm. some, like on the yeah. San Joaquin, it's, a, it's still a big part of it. And, and, and not everybody got zero. Also, yeah, yeah, no, it really varies. I mean, I, I was trying to say all that information would be helpful. I mean, the thing that people most people may recognize, but they may not, is that we really are an anomaly here, even within the U.S., not just, uh, or the Western U.S., not even uh, Australia. Australia spent 10 years getting their data down where everybody transmits electronically what they're using and what they're putting back in, and everybody can see it, and that's what they built their water market on. That's, everybody sees it as I understand it, and, and, but it took them about 10 years to do. That's why I think we need more data. There's all kinds of data that would be helpful. There are all kinds of things that would be helpful to report. I, you know, there's something in between what the Australians have done or going all the way to adjudications of water rights and where we are right now that would give people a better picture of what's really happening. I, I was doing a, a webinar last week with the the Judicial Council that ALF put together and uh, uh, a number of uh, judges from the West were on as well and they all measure the water. They don't necessarily measure discharge but they measure much more. They use metering. It's, it's a more um, complete system both above and below ground even though they manage groundwater uh, differently. Um, than we do, but even than each other does, the, the level of information that they have that everybody gets to look at is just much greater. And I would just say that the discharge is just a piece of the information we don't have. There's seepage, there's there, depletions were not estimated as well as they might be. That's one of the, th I mean, we need to learn from what didn't work that well this year and make it better. And one of the things we 
collectively guessed wrong on was whether we had reserved enough in storage because we didn't assess the depletions. It's a piece of what um, David was referring to, but there's more as well where we just we don't have a full sense of how the system works and particularly as you're thinking about managing salinity again because if you lose it the consequences are so huge uh, more information would definitely be helpful but you don't want to bury people in reporting and data and so I think there's a very thoughtful space that's very important to spend some time on uh, collectively in that circle of folks that a uh, number of people talked about to think about a better way of doing things we don't have to go zero to the perfect uh, system uh, all this year, but we could make some real progress that would, again, give more transparency, more comfort. I mean, when people, in the absence of data you can count on, everybody thinks somebody else is pulling something over on them, whether you're a person speaking for a fish or you're a water user or whatnot, and that, there was a lot of that. I'd like more light next year than heat. So I'm looking at the clock here, and I'm looking at Kate Trend, who's um, keep trying to keep me on track. So I think if, if it's okay with you, we're going to open it up for one, maybe two quick questions, because I think we're going to try to wrap up on time. Um, so raise your hand if you have something you'd like to ask this panel. And we've got folks ready to, or if there aren't questions, we can go for it. Okay, Jay. I was intrigued with your remark, David, about some of the water users were suggesting to voluntarily say how much they're using earlier on than they would have to. In a lot of Western water rights, in a lot of Western water rights where we have curtailments, they have the water users call their rights right. so that the water masters, local water masters, in real time can do the, the balances to make sure that, that the water is being fully beneficially used. Do you think that's likely to be something we're going to move into, at least among the larger water users uh, in the system? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, did everybody hear Professor Lund's question? I assume, OK. Um, you know, I think in the way that that happens, right? I mean, particularly for folks who have contract supplies. And again, I, I think you know we talk a lot about water rights. But I think we have to understand, of course, that a good portion of this state is overlain by contracts and when you have a contract you essentially make the call don't you to the department or the bureau or whatever it is under the contract so I I think in a way that's already happening could it happen yes in a, in a broader set of circumstances I suspect that's that's possible but um, you know I think the again the, I think the thing is that the districts and the agencies I know they want to understand that information. Obviously, it's in their interest. And so I think there's always this assumption that people, they're somehow trying to avoid that. And quite the contrary, they're trying to understand it. They're spending you know, millions and probably tens of millions of dollars every year collectively trying to understand that as, as well as anybody. And I, so I think that they, you know, that's something we ought to be talking about further is how we get to that kind of a level. Other questions? One over here. Ah, sorry. Behind, behind you, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I've been trying to ask this question for probably an hour. Um, I've been to several different water forums in the last year, year and a half. Um, I'm a planning commissioner, the city of Folsom, and I'd like to have the conversation about housing. How do we keep building thousands and thousands of houses that really don't have any way to recycle their water uh, or, or not, just the fact that we keep adding more houses and we obviously have an environmental issue as well as many others I've heard today. Would you like to jump in first? I'll, I'll try, having also come out of local government and land use planning law when I first started. It's interesting, I mean, it, there are a lot of ways to answer that question. I think one of it is, you know, we're not organized to really manage it down to that level. I mean, we really are very disconnected. We don't have a planned economy. When I was a Chinese studies major in college, and that was the one thing that was appealing about the five-year plans, is that you actually could have a stab at integrating everything, but we have to try and juggle it in the system that we have, which I, I like. I want to be clear on that, dear Marcus. <laughs> I want to be really clear on that, on that one. I'm just acknowledging. Um, but uh, the decisions take place at very different 
arenas. I mean, the connection between water, there have been bits of legislation that say new developments have to show they have a source of water. You have certain counties that say if you're going to build something, you've got to retrofit something else. I mean, so the actual system is there's no one's in a position other than the local entity to be able to make those decisions. So at a state level, we want to tread light. The subsidiary, we want to tread lightly in telling locals what to do. At a, at a larger scale, we could be way more efficient with the water we do use through efficiency, retrofitting appliances, fixtures, even going as far as many Australian communities where they've decided they do want yards, but they don't have enough water for yards, and they've put in not everywhere, but pretty substantial investments in capturing rooftop, what falls on the roof, what falls in a whole watershed so they can keep their parks and uh, playgrounds green. I mean, it's really, they're even more attached to their greenery and yards than, uh, than we are, but a massive investment in that gray water system so that when you have a house, you are not using fresh potable water for flushing your toilet and buildings are starting to move to that. If you look at the San Francisco PUC example or Irvine Ranch Water District with the dual plumbing. So we're slowly inching towards um, what some of the Australians call the right water for the right job. There are tremendous, tremendous strides we can make in building our housing stock, let alone businesses and other things, to use water more intelligently than treating it to this incredible level that's required for potable use and then using it for everything. So we, there's a long way to go, but figuring out the roles between the state and the locals is, is a pretty tough arena. It helps when we have money to help, which is why the bond is helpful and our state revolving funds are helpful uh, on certain things. But I, I do think you're raising a question that we need to talk about. I would focus on being more efficient in the, using the water we use rather than just numbers of people because we are very, very, very inefficient as a society in how we use water. So I think we have decades of water to be uh, plumbed, if you will, uh, by being more efficient, recycling, stormwater capture, rainwater capture, and gray water. We, we have a lot of space there. Did, Jill, did you want to? Touch sure. on that too. I, I can add to that maybe just a little bit and being 2015 this is the year of the urban water management planning effort by most um, water utilities so it may not I mean we're hoping for an extension till 2016 but these reports usually take us 12 to 18 months to prepare and they're supposed to look forward 20 years to say how are we going to serve the projected the existing customers plus the projected development during that 20-year period. They form the basis for um, whether or not certain requirements are appropriate, whether the plans include any new development has to have recycled water or whether any new development has to actually um, maybe commit to providing rebates for other parts of town that are older to create the water um, for that area. But I think your local water utility is probably just ramping up to do its urban water management plan. Then in theory, you're, um, for the larger developments, there would be an evaluation of whether or not enough water is there and finally a will serve letter. And those are all steps in the process to get to the um, individual houses. That being said, once somebody's fully vested and has gotten all their checks, um, a drought doesn't allow most agencies to take that right away from them. I, I just maybe add one, one thought too here, and, and, and as you said, you're from Folsom, which is one of the places, one of the large urban areas that, that really was looking at some, a serious shortfall until some lucky rains came in, in, in February. And you know, as, as a group of us were looking kind of around the state at which urban agencies were more resilient to the drought than others, a big piece of that was having interconnections with neighboring agencies. And so that's, that's a huge part of the strength of Southern California system is there's this very large wholesaler and then networks of smaller wholesalers and it's possible to get water from one place to another that in a different way. In the Bay Area, I think that's, that turned out really useful. Yeah. Um, it, the Bay Area has a lot of smaller and larger agencies from East Bay Mud and San Francisco, San Francisco PUC 
even to Santa Clara Valley Water District and then much smaller agencies like my own. And we have um, entered into a principles of agreement of a Bay Area Regional Reliability Program that's based largely on creating inner ties and we'll be going for grants. A lot of these are expensive, but once that um, system inner ties is available, if the Hetch Hetchy watershed gets more snow that year, they can maybe share with some of the others. If state project water or our own groundwater basin is very healthy, we might be able to share with others who are shorter. So it allows that kind of flexibility and local re regional um, reliability and exchanges to happen that might not otherwise be possible without the infrastructure in place. Right, and my, my prediction is that, that that's gonna be increasingly important in places like this, the Sacramento metro area and so on too. So I just want us to wrap up with, give you each about 30 seconds for your top priority for what you'd like to see happen this year, either in preparation for if this year is still dry or for kind of getting us on the right footing for the next drought if we do get rain. I'll start with, uh, well, I think, again, we have to really manage what we have. And so we have to redouble our efforts for conservation and sharing that information. And along with that, I think, um, as I tour around the state and hear the different, um, where the different comments come from with regard to conservation, whether you're in Sacramento, Red Bluff, or in Southern California. And so I think there's some education <laughs> and some more um, serious um, discussion on um, data, recycling, conservation measures at the individual home or business level and be able to process that information as it relates back to how much water we have. The other thing that has come up for us um, as we reach out and provide technical support and uh, to the local agencies and some regional agencies is really the, the uh, emergency contingency plans were based on um, some facts or assumptions that are not true or not that that was intentional, but I think the assumption is if you can just reach over and get a water transfer, then you're good. Well, if the water's not there to transfer, you're not good. And so I think part of that um, this next year is we need to go out and really talk um, really closely and carefully about what is your emergency contingency plan? Are you ready to implement that? Do we need to modify and, re and address that now? Do you need the state assistance or you know, mutual aid through adjacent agencies to come together? And I think we saw an example of that in Sac Sacramento. Folsom is one where everybody, tree got rattled pretty good. And I yeah. think we still see the energy of that, uh, additional conservation measures, some um, physical changes to their systems, um, some relationships that have been built to, to prepare for uh, future dry years. And so I think that's, Managing what we have right now is gonna be super critical. Thank you, Jill. Um, sort of a three-pronged approach. First is financing. I mean, three cheers to the bond, but most of the bond money is gonna have matching funds of so some sort, which are hard to create with Prop 218 limitations right now. So that's um, one piece of it. Another is the environmental piece. I think I, I was really intrigued by Jane's comment about um, different environmental guidelines for our native species to survive because chances are that they are more drought tolerant and so the flows that are appropriate in a wet year may not be needed as much in a dry year and maybe we can do more of that co-equal goal balancing. And third and last, I think that the transfers um, we had a lot of opportunities this year to try out exchanges and transfers I think there's still room for improvement. Some of the um, actual processing of exchanges and transfers is still rather cumbersome and requires multiple agency approvals where data is requested and the agencies don't necessarily have it available. What do we do? Does that mean they get denied the transfer? And uh, we get into that public health and safety need issue. Top wish. Uh, the value of storage uh, during a dry period. Um, obviously, you know, we live in a state, 38 million people, growing to, what, 50 million by, what, 20, 30, or whatever the number is staggering. Um, it's a highly managed water system, and the value of storage to me this year was, was just real uh, obvious. Um, I look, uh, I think, and uh, Professor Lund talked a lot about, you know, urban California this year not being 
you know, too affected by the drought and overall. And if you look at that, uh, look at the value of Diamond Valley, look at the value of Los Vaqueros, look at the value of Hetch Hetchy, pick your favorite reservoir. And yes, the groundwater element was, is critical, uh, as Jill will tell you, and many others, but uh, that surface storage, Folsom, look at city of Folsom without a, or look at the whole Sacramento metropolitan area without a, a, a supply in, uh, in Folsom Reservoir. Um, and so I think there's just so many opportunities to look at that and try to um, augment that, to reoperate that, and to look at some new opportunities for regulating reservoirs uh, throughout the state to, to help during the next dry period. Uh, t I'd say two things, I've talked about them generally. I, I hope that we make progress on having more thoughtful, reality-based conversations in the right forums, water board just being one, and we will have far more transparency and, and discussion and planning in advance, as Chuck talked about when he was speaking, and I think that's uh, important and great. And hopefully we will make uh, better decisions on the things we didn't do as well as we could, protecting storage and, and really understanding the system. And so let, let's hope we do that. I also really hope, uh, and I feel very strongly about this, next that we keep up the momentum that we finally gotten after decades in California of having people able to talk about the whole range of ways in which we can become more water secure, whether it's in efficiency, recycling, stormwater capture, uh, you name it, using, uh, using it better, working together. The fact that the fish agencies and the projects were able to work together so closely, Bill talked about it, others have talked about it, is really historic. I mean, when people write about this in decades to come, I'm hoping people will say this was the year when we finally got over ourselves and figured out how to have a rational conversation about how to hold, not, you called the co-equal co goals, but there are more pieces to it than that, economics, health and safety, uh, ecosystem, getting ahead of the curve. I mean, we're having a more intelligent conversation about water in more places this year, and I think the drought accelerated it. We were starting to do it before because I think people are just ready for a whole host of demographic and other uh, reasons. And I think we are at that historical inflection point, and I just hope we keep it up and continue to make progress, pedal to the metal, across the spectrum on figuring out how to use this precious resource uh, more intelligently and helpfully. Well, thank you. And big thanks to this panel. And a big thanks to all of the speakers and to all of you for, for staying with us. And I also want to just call out a few people, including Kelly Holt, who's standing back there. Wave your hand. She's our events manager at PPIC. Um, and you've seen a, 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 lot, a lot of folks around the scenes with, with little PPIC uh, lo, um, names on their uh, acronyms on their tags, and they've been really fantastic in, in helping us to, to make this happen. And from our communications team, from our office here in Sacramento, from the water team. And so thanks to all of you all for, for making this so seamless. And please, if you haven't already filled out your evaluation form, do that before you leave, because it's really helpful for us to have your feedback. And have a great rest of your day. And I hope that, Jane, we can take your lessons to heart without having to go through 13 dry years in a row, or it was 11, or however many it is, because I think that I, think that, that was really rich, and so thank you for coming out. <laughs>